This is the Sales Babble Podcast, episode 270, the No Crap Sales Journal. Well, the word's not really crap, it's shh. Well, the word's not really crap. An interview with Carson Cook. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And now your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, sales babblers. This is Pat Helmers, and this is the podcast where we believe in the possibility that anyone can become proficient in sales. Quiet people, shy people, people who think that selling is yucky. But if you're one of those people out there who's got some passion that they are really all about, and they know deep in their hearts that they need somehow to get better at being persuasive and getting people excited and enrolled in their great idea, well, What better way to do that than to learn sales? You're at the right place. Well, our guest today is Carson Cook. He's the author of the book, The No Crap Sales Book. But the word's not crap. The word's really shh. Well, the word's not crap. Well, anyhow, Carson believes that although profanity is taboo, in some situations, it's the exact right tool. Today, we babble about using commitment to advance the sale, and that's the path for getting to closed deals. So, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Carson. You ready to babble? Yes, I'm ready to babble. Carson, why don't you tell everybody where you're at right now? Um, I'm actually in the Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, right now in our in our center office. And where is Nepal? Where is that at? Uh, ne- Nepal's located between India and China. And it's like up in the mountains, isn't it? Uh, kind of, yeah. It's kind of like a perception of, you know, growing up on a farm in Nebraska, right, or the, the big city. But no, yeah, we're located in Kathmandu, Nepal. It's it's in the mountains, um, you know, in the, in the they call it the valley. In the valley. So now you don't sound like from your accent that you're from Nepal. No, I am definitely not from Nepal. Um, I actually grew up, you know, grew up, grew up in the United States, born in Salt Lake City, grew up in Nebraska, um, actually went to, you know, school in uh, in Washington and then also in Nebraska, um, so I'm definitely from America, just uh, now living in Nepal and traveling all over Asia and running our businesses and, you know, and you, making what, life happen. And what is your business? Um, well, we run, a, we run a contact center called um, Centrix, which is basically a B2B setting um, appointment generating uh, company for ISOs. So we set appointments for, you know, mainly merchant processing as well as insurance, MCA loans, stuff like that. And then we also run a company called Authorized International so we actually started out here based in the States, um, and we do credit card processing. So, um, you know, POS systems, uh, stuff like that. We've built up a very successful portfolio. And oh, I've heard the main of that. Story, oh, I know yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, that's us, man. And the main, main story of coming out here was just that it's, you know, more cost effective. And, you know, we first started off, we didn't have a ton of, you know, a ton of investment to put towards it. So we decided to take the gamble and move to Asia and get it all set up. And here we are. So is this call center, I assume, runs during your night or daytime? Correct. Yeah, we're actually up all night over here, and then we just kind of sleep during the day. And we're in, we're in the process of kind of opening it up actually for a couple of the same type of campaigns, but for Australia. So it'd be a twenty four hour kind of uh, operation. But so it's in right, the process right now, it's 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 noon my time. What time is it there? Midnight. Yep. Right. Right now it is exactly ten fifty two, which is kind of weird. They're on a they're fifteen minutes different than the rest of the world. So it's actually ten fifty two right now. Bizarre. And then in the evening, yeah, it's weird. <laughs> but it's it. They want to be. They want to be. They want to be a little different than India. You know, that's the thing is that they're they're very close to India, and then you know they rely on a lot of their you know economic um, you know support. Same thing with China, but they they still want to be a little different. So they have that fifteen minute di- time difference out here, which is kind of funny. Interesting. So you you have a new book out. It is called the uh, yes. It's here. Let me, let me get this right here. It is called the No Shh. See, I can't say this yep. word on Sales yep. Babble. Sales Journey. Yep. <laughs> yep. No problem. I, <laughs> that's how it is. This was there to grab a little bit of attention. It's uh, the kind of the the No uh, the No the No Shh Sales Journal. And, it, and it's interesting. Uh, I, I, I was I was going through your introduction, and you said in here. Let me let me read this from you. You said, "This is this is the point that what's thought about in swearing in communication turns out to be incorrect." 
you say that this should also make you wonder what other misconceptions in communication either hurt or help you in your sales process. You may wonder, are there other things that I've spent years learning or hurting in sales? Is there anything I've spent years unlearning that would actually help my sales process? That's exactly. That's the common thing is that, you know, the, the idea is this, that there's, a, there's actually come some studies out that, you know, like I said, profanity is kind of looked at on as a, as a taboo subject or someone that would, you know, kind of be put in place of, you know, as sales professionals, we need to be very formal. We need to be dressed up. We need to know our stuff. Um, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the funny part about this is that, you know, using profanity has shown that the t- type of people that don't, I wouldn't say use profanity on a regular basis, but it's still within their language and they have the capacity to still use a little bit of profanity in front of their clients kind of shows them, shows their client um, a little bit, actually, believe it or not, a little bit more trust. Um, and there's studies that there's tons of studies out that show that, that, you know, there's, and, and, and I've noticed this too, with some of them are, you know, fortune 500 clients that I've personally had to sell myself and my background. And, you know, sometimes I'll let a word slip and it just kind of emphasizes the meaning behind what I'm trying to say. And it kind of gets their attention a little bit, but you know, it seems to be that, you know, sometimes people that use profanity can be a little bit, uh, more trustworthy than those that don't. So there's a, the, the, I started the book off with this to kind of say, you know, it's a, it's a common sense journal to, you know, uh, sales basics for sales professionals that have had years of experience but need to brush up on things, maybe learn a, learn a few more tricks. And then also some, you know, some newer sales professionals to kind of get to get the actual foundation built and, and not listen to, you know, um, you know, just tons of information. So I, I put that in there to kind of get a little bit of a, you know, a spark to understand, you know, if you, Hey, you know this, yeah, no, sh-, you know, like I, I get it, you know, I understand it. There it is. So that's the, that's the reason for the title of the book. I'm always of the notion that you should dress the same way as the decision maker dresses. So if they're dressed up in a suit and tie, that's how you got to dress, you know, but, yeah. but if they're, yeah. but, but they're dressed up in a in t-shirt and jeans and flip flops, I don't know. <laughs> you should be, yeah. dre- you should be dressing at their level. I kind of have yep. that same feeling maybe about language, that you should be speaking in the same manner they are. I could see some industries where profane language really matters. For a while yep. there, yep. though, I was selling to, I was selling to educators, mm-hmm. and there is mm-hmm. no bad language, hardly. No, <laughs> of the course not. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. I was like exactly. super duper careful about words that I used, mm-hmm. and um, I was really, 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 really careful. To the point that it creeped into my personal life. Right, right. You know, and that's 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 the thing too. You know, it's like kind of I would imagine like you know working with that or like I said, a very big CEO or very formal. It's not it's not that every time you would use that profanity, but it's one of those things where, for example, if you were let's say you were, you were selling to an educator, you were selling to, for example, a principal, and you know you got on some sort of level of rapport with them to the point where. You know, they, she in, would introduce a teacher, and let's just say that you know that that the the whole group uh, actually really loved your product, really loved to go along with it, and it's kind of funny because now you're you have such good rapport with this principal that you know she might gossip a little bit, right? And that's how education works too. My my mom used to be a teacher; she's a famous children's author, um, you know, and 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 she might lean over and say, you know, she's just a big, you know, she's a bitch, you know, or something like that. At that point, if if the principal could lean over to a sales professional and say that, or <laughs> You, know, you could be on that rapport level, something like that. That shows that you have the sale, you have the deal. They trust you enough, and that's the kind of that's I guess kind of what I'm alluding at is that it's not proper in every scenario, but it's 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 one of those things where it's it's good for your customer to feel like they 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 can you know they can have that that type of not not that type of language, but just maybe once you know something slips a little bit, you don't have to worry about it, right? You know, same thing with a sales professional. Like if you really have a a solid rapport with your customer, your client, then you should be able to feel like you're talking to them as a friend, not saying that you'd use profanity as a, with your friends all the time too. It's just kind of showing that, you know, within those same studies that, you know, you, the use of this taboo is, you know, shows more trust actually. It kind of gives more. Um, another one is, uh, what, what's his name? Gary, um, Vine Gary V. Check. Yeah, get, yeah, like he loves it. I mean, that's that's the thing is he gets a lot of flack too for yeah. using profanity in his podcast and this and that. But he's he's extremely to the point. And you know, when you watch him, you kind of get that feeling of just trust. Like he is he is no bullshit. He he is that's what it is, and that's what you know that's his message. So when you're trying to sell something to someone too, if something comes out a little bit in a very intense presentation, 
you're you're showing, you know, you're showing your customer you're very you're serious about this. This is something where if you don't have my product, it could hurt you. You know, like it's damaging. You know, I, what I have, you need, and I, I'm here to. You know, I truly believe in my product. Here it is. You know that kind of stuff. So that's that's kind of the basis, I guess, behind the the idea to start the book off. And I wanted to start it off with a little bit of a bang and kind of an understanding. And of, it does. You know, <laughs> we might not learn right, might not learn as much. You know, and and there's a lot in sales that you know, that, like I said, that you could have been taught the wrong way, right? So if you're running a call center, do you guys do you guys do um, do you do sales development? SDR, Correct. Yes. Development? Yeah, we do. Um, one of the th- one of the things, and and we and I do the CSO Pro. So the CSO Pro dot com is is kind of my weekend fun thing. I actually have a passion for uh, training sales. So out here, we actually do a lot of training and sales consulting for a lot of the dealerships here. I fly down to India and speak with the, you know, some of the various groups that sell like BMW, uh, Ducati, Mercedes Benz, stuff like that. And um, our call center here are we have to kind of train every one of our staff because we're an appointment setting call center. It's very much sales driven. I mean, it's very, uh, you know, it's, um, in, and, and kind of getting the Nepali culture to understand our sales, col- our sales culture from the States is, is a little bit difficult, but after a while you'll find out that with the right training and the right information, they're very good at it. You know, they, they do a very good job with it. So maybe you could teach us what are they, what do you teach them? What are the five, six things you teach them when they're doing, when they're doing, um, an outreach call of some kind. Um, with an out- yeah, yeah. So, so the five things that we, we teach them, some of the things that we do is that, you know, um, and, and we, we talk about this is a little bit different is face to face sales or over the phone sales, face to face sales. You get a lot of different communication benefits from being face to face. Okay. Because communication about 90% of communication is not necessarily the content that you say, it's how you deliver it and actually how you appear, those little social constructs. So these guys don't have that benefit. It's the same thing with any call center in the United States or anywhere else is that you have um, what we call the seven-second bias. You have 30 seconds to make a lifelong lasting impression um, with someone that is over the phone. So it needs to be dynamic and personal. So one of the things that we teach our callers when they call, they call as if they were a customer. It kind of puts the, cut, the, the merchant or the client you know, in a perspective of where they need to interact instead of a sales call. So it's completely different. Then when it goes into the pitch, what we teach them is to, you know, use certain English char- uh, characteristics, certain words that you would not normally think of that shows empathy. So when a customer would say no, this and that, we would say, well, you know, I completely understand how you feel, right? Like I understand we have to kind of teach that idea. Like I'm in the same boat as you. Like I understand your response, but let me tell you why we need to have this appointment. Then that appointment is set. Right. So uh, those are a couple of things is that we, we teach them to give the carrot over the phone as fast as possible. And the carrot is like the carrot in front of the rabbit, which is basically the value added proposition as soon as physically possible for the attention span of that, you know, two minute phone call. I love that. You get that value proposition out as quick as you can. Uh, yep. Quick. Then that what that does is if they if they are remotely I wouldn't say remotely interested or if they have then then you know then you get those buying questions that you can elaborate on and then it angles them for the initial goal and their sale is not a product their sale is an appointment so we let the sales professionals in the states go in and sell the deal but this is just the foot in the door just a you know just the carrot the value the main value added proposition to get that person in the in in front of the owner to make them you know have a decision. And then what, what happens after is that, you know, highly trained sales professional with their sales toolbox and their process goes in there to close the deal later. Right. That makes sense. That's that. And that, and that's pretty common in many sales organizations where they have SDRs yep. or LDRs or BDRs, whatever you want to call them. And then they hand it off to some account executive who will, who will do the sales presentation yep. and, you know, if all goes right, close the deal. That's right. Yeah. So, but for, for today, I'm more interested in what in what you're teaching in regards to these the, these these business development reps. Yeah. What's definitely. the mis- What's the mistake you see people making all the time? Uh, um, the the toughest thing to deal with a, with an outside sales representative or a BDB representative, um, especially in our industry, we work within the merchant services industry, and it's one of the most competitive industries that it's out there. But I stress to sales professionals to get into this industry because a competitive industry means that it's profitable, okay? But the difference is that it's also a huge filtering industry. That means that if you're not good, then you'll say, well, this didn't work for me, or you'll make up an excuse. 
Um, the biggest thing with this is that in credit card processing, it's so competitive because it's so lucrative. You just need to learn your process. One of the biggest failures that I see with a lot of, I would say, ISOs, owners of ISOs or representatives within this industry is that. Hey, folks, I just wanted to step in here for a second to define a term. Carson uses the term ISO. That is an independent sales organization. It's, it's usually synonymous with a credit card processing company. These organizations, these companies, usually they have some kind of relationships with member banks, which is the business that he's in. So, um, so I want to share that for a little bit of context. You know, it is, it is, is to kill their learning curve as fast as possible. Some sales representatives that have been in sales for 25, 30 years will still fail because they're, they're just too stubborn not to listen to a guaranteed process or a foundation that is put in place. And it's literally the same foundation as car sales. I mean, there's, 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 um, you know, and Jordan Belfort talks a lot about this too, is straight line theory. <laughs> you push clients to the left and to the right, and you want to keep a client on a process. And his main point is that same fact is that, you know, the top sales representatives, they have a sales process. And the thing is, even older sales professionals will not be able to recognize what step they're on with their client. They look around and it's, you know, they, they, they didn't do that process. So it's even just having younger sales professionals or older sales professionals follow a process. And it's not difficult because it's a roadmap. I mean, it's step one. So we call it the steps of the sale. Obviously, like every other sales organization has them. But believe it or not, if you look with an insurance or car sales or, you know, even, even corporate real estate or long ticket sales, it's still the same damn process. It's just it could be a little bit longer. And our job as sales professionals is to shrink that process. Okay, the top guys can do a five or six visit kind of thing in one sit. That's their goal. A guy that can sell a corporate real estate building over a year and a half can do it in six months. Well, why do you think they do it in six months? Because they follow the same process as everybody else, but they know how to build a sense of urgency with their customers or their firm. And they get groups to commit to certain actions and they get them through the process quickly. Uh, so that they can clear their pipeline and focus on other clients. I mean, that's the that's the goal. You said that there were five steps. I think I no, there's it. there's more than there's more than five steps in the book. There's um, kind of a definition of broad steps because I you know a, a, a process that's that's very similar to like like you would say a car sale or auto insurance or a quick sale. And the goal is the same day close. So obviously, that's you know that's that should be your goal. Um, like, you know, professional sports, but you might make it to the A level or the B level. That's fine. You make, make, make it to the college level, but at least you're trying to go to the top and the top in sales is the same day close. You meet a firm, you have a product, you sell it, you sign it up, you move on to the next client. Um, so with that, the steps of the sales should always be some sort of introduction followed by stating the agenda, which is, uh, which is explaining the process that you're about to take your client through. And that's another flaw that I see a lot with sales professionals nowadays is that they assume communication. They expect their client to know their process. Then after that, it goes into what we would call discovery or qualifying, where at this point you're going to you know, gather all the information that you need to close the deal, but also all the information you need to assist your client to actually really put on a show. Your job is to facilitate a transaction, but also to make sure their product works for them and all the concerns are met. You know, like we talk about objections, they're not necessarily objections, they're just concerns and helping your customer through a process. Then after that's there, you don't want to give so much information or the best information until there's some sort of commitment. So if therefore I'm going to take you through this process and I do this and I display it to you, I need to know that I have the confidence of earning your business or our firm or my company has the confidence of earning your business. Once that firm says, okay, then there's some sort of process where you need to give that final presentation. But you never want to give that final presentation without a commitment or you're turning your sales process into a billboard. You know, they're shopping. You know, they, that's going to set you, you know, aside from the other 20 pitches that came in today to, for your group, I was the one that said, I'm going to give you this information enough to get your interest, the carrot. Here's it. Here it is. Here's what we're going to do. But if I can do this, I've got two or three more things you're going to love. It's going to be perfect for your – I did my analysis. I did my study on your company. This is going to fit perfectly within there. But I need to know if I show you this, do I have a chance to earn your business, which is a green light. you know, And that's, a, that's, a, that's some sort of commitment. They say yes. We give the full presentation. Once that full presentation is given, you kind of you know, round them out, meet any concerns they might have, figure out the proper timeline for the close. And then at that point, once every part of this process is solved, every ob objection is met or you would say every concern is met, 
because we're not, you know, not they're not objections anymore. They're just concerns, and they're they're you know they're valid, and you work with them through that process. Then the close is extremely easy. It's probably one of the easiest parts of the sale. You just say, "All right, is there anything else that we've covered?" That no, nope, I think we're ready. All right, let's do it. And that's it. You shake their hand, and the deal's done. I don't come from a world of a one call close. I come from the world of the enterprise sale. Yeah. Lots of people are in the room. They all got to talk amongst themselves. It's competitive. Mm-hmm. They got to go talk to other competitors. They got to yep. like, yep. and it just it takes lots of meetings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of meetings. <laughs> there's no, there's no way out of it. <clears throat> but even <laughs> in that case, Carson, it's mm-hmm. it's all about process. Correct. All about process. All about following that. All about following that foundation. And yes. you know. Whether you work in a, you know, like I said, that same environment where it is not a same call close, each meeting that you have with each department to check on it, you're still checking for commitment. You're still presenting this and saying, well, when can we move this forward? Boom. Next part. When can we have? And then we get them all in the same room, same goal. And that sense of urgency is going to bring that six call close, you know, six, six meetings, 18 meetings down to seven. You know, your goal is always just to shorten the amount of time between when um, you meet them, you, and then you close them, right? And, if, and the faster that process goes, no matter what it is, and this, this is the same thing. It's all reflective. So that was a very basic model or a basic foundation, but um, same processes. There's always that introduction. There's that letting each department know about the process, and then they all confirm the process. Then they can search their competitors, but you're, you're going to try and get a commitment that if we, you have the solution, they're all going to say yes. Then they all say yes. Then finally, you give the full presentation you know, you did the green light, you did this, then you, then you sit down and then you, you, you check with each department for the close and then you finally sign it. Right. So the foundation and the process is so important. That's the first thing you should learn when you, when you come to a sales organization is their process. You know, you're, you're more likely to succeed with that organization. If you follow that foundation, that's proven. What's the thing that makes your book unique other than the title? Um, what makes it unique is that Sales professionals don't have a ton of time. I wouldn't say they don't have a ton of time. They got a ton of time, but the thing is, is that it's the same thing. We're very energetic people. Um, you know, we're very involved with this and that, oh, yeah. and not necessarily everybody reads and this and that. So this book is a very, very, very short, and I would say it's a Cliff Notes version. So some very fundamental, ba- not not basic, but very fundamental way of communicating. And the thing is, that there's a lot of basic communication techniques that are overlooked, and as part of the CSO Pro too. I feel that say, you know, that sales or communication should should be based in, you know, should be based in school as a degree. I mean, we have sales and marketing, but they teach you marketing. They don't teach you sales. So this is just kind of an entry level book that you know has a lot of really good information in it. That's gonna that's gonna help you build a very very solid. It shows you how to build a very solid foundation if you're a new sales professional. And this information you can take to any model. Or any system, like you were mentioning before, with any organization that you can use. It's going to help you communicate better. That's the main point of this book is to help sales professionals communicate better. And that doesn't just overflow into your job. It overflows into your relationships. It overflows into your kids' lives, your, your, you know, your coworkers, pretty much everybody you communicate with. This is what this book's designed to do to help you improve communication. Now, this book's coming out May 1st. Is that right? Yep. It's coming out May 1st on Amazon. And how can people find the book? Um, well, they can find the book um, when it comes out. It's going to be on Amazon. You just have to, you know, just go to just go to Amazon and type in Carson Cook, so C A R S O N or C O O K, um, or type in, you know, the no, sh- sorry, nope, <laughs> sales journal, and it should pop up for everybody. Love it. So, yeah. And then yeah, also yeah. we're doing we're doing like I said a little promotion thing on the website too at the CSOPro.com. Um, which is a ton of free content, a ton of great sales information that we do. We put up two videos per week. Um, we put up, you know, two or three blog posts per day. But it's just a ton of really great, uh, find out, you know, um, foundational level sales information that can, you know, help. And a lot of it's based off of, like we said, improving communication. I like it. I like it a lot. Well, Carson, thank you very much for visiting us. You know, halfway around the world. I really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Well, that was a lot of fun talking to Carson. And like he mentioned, he's got a new book out on Amazon. And if if you're a sales professional and you're looking to get back to the basics, if you're new and you're looking to try to build your profession on some foundation, this book might be for you. And uh, I've got links to it in the show notes. 
at uh, www.salesbabble.com slash 270. And while you're there, you may have noticed that there are other links on that same, on those same show notes uh, on related topics. So you can keep the lifelong learning going all day long. If you haven't done so already, make sure and subscribe to the podcast on whatever podcast tool you got, Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify. Uh, I'm, I'm on YouTube. <laughs> no matter where you go, you're going to find Sales Babble. It's easy peasy to find. Um, or you can get on the email list, and I will send you an email every Tuesday morning. It'll give you a little, it'll give you a little taste of what the podcast is about with links directly, and you don't have to think too hard about, about listening to it. So that's all I've got for today, folks. Until next week, take care and have a highly successful and a profitable selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble Podcast. Find us at www.salesbabble.com.